morning, if you will, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. In the Gospels, there are about 12 or 13 passages where we find Jesus saying the words, follow me. And what we're doing this week is we're going to take five of those texts And we're just going to take a look at those and see how they apply to the idea of discipleship. Discipleship is following Jesus. And these passages where He invites people to follow Him help us understand what it really means to be His disciple. So that's what we're going to do starting with today here in Matthew chapter 16. It is interesting that in Matthew chapter 16, we're going to pick up after we have this interaction between Jesus and Peter, and he asks Peter, who do men say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? And it's in this text that Matthew Matthew records Peter saying to Jesus that you are the Son of God. What I want you to notice is what happens right after that. Look starting in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. I'll stop there. Let me explain something that happens in the Gospels that's really interesting. Is that in the Gospels, Jesus seems to spend the first portion of the Gospels a lot of times trying to get them to see he is God's Son. And then there comes a shift when that happens that he then turns from the fact that he is God's son to the suffering he will endure. Now in Mark, it's really easy to see this because Mark, in the middle of this turn, presents that story where Jesus heals the blind man and yet he can't fully see and then Jesus opens his eyes completely. And that idea there in Mark is that this man is kind of an object lesson of the disciples that they've been seeing Jesus dimly, but now He's going to try to open their eyes and let them see Him clearly, which the clear representation of Jesus is not just that He's the Messiah, but that His kingdom is not earthly, and that He is going to have to go to Jerusalem and suffer and be executed and be raised on the third day. And so we see that shift happening here with Matthew. By the way, Mark puts that after Peter's confession as well. So we see that shift happening here in verse 21. Look at verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And when you read what Matthew does with his account, he presents Peter saying what? You are the Son of God. And then Jesus starts explaining what that really means, and Peter says, no, that can't be. That, that, that can't be. You, you, that, that can never happen to you. And Jesus responds with this rebuke, calling him Satan. Immediately after the confession, that is the foundational understanding of the kingdom, that Jesus is God's Son. And then Jesus turns after this, and this is where we want to look at in verse 24, and He looks at the disciples and He essentially says to them, you are going to have to choose who you're going to be. Start reading with me there in verse 24. Jesus told His disciples, if anyone would come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming. Jesus is saying, you're going to have to make a choice. He begins with this one option that we'll call this morning self-preservation. You can choose yourself. You can choose to preserve self and to preserve who you are 
and you can put yourself at the center and the forefront of what you want your life to be like. And that is tempting, isn't it? Isn't it tempting to put self first? In fact, isn't self-preservation, or maybe sometimes we call this survival, isn't that the natural reaction we have to life? When it comes to making hard choices, we want to make choices that protect us. And maybe even if it's not protecting us, it's protecting our family. Truthfully, that's still all about self-preservation. Because they're an extension of us. But there's also a sense that we have this verbalized mantra today of sorts, beyond even the survivalist instinct, have made me most important. You have things like you've got to look out for yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, no one else is going to do it. You can't trust anybody but yourself. And look, even the idea of self-care that is promoted so often, and I do think there's something there that is needed, but sometimes we go too far with that idea that what is more important than anything else is me. And what has morphed into that, by the way, is that no longer is it really self-preservation that we're talking about, but what we're really talking about is the promotion of my life to an extent that I live more comfortably than anybody else around me. That's what the end result sometimes comes. Now, I want to just walk through this text and show you where Jesus is giving you this option of self-preservation. First, in verse 25, he says there that you can live for yourself. Whoever would save his life but lose it, whatever loses his life for my sake will find it. You can put yourself first and live for self. And by the way, the Bible's filled with examples of people who did that. Starting in Genesis chapter 4, Cain puts himself first when he kills his brother Abel. Think about 2 Samuel 11 when David sins with Bathsheba. That is all about self. He is wanting to seek self. In 1 Kings 21, Ahab and Jezebel. In Esther, Haman is thinking about himself and what he does in regards to the Jews. In Matthew, Herod is putting himself first when he has all of the children killed. Wanting to preserve his rule. Judas, when he accepts the 30 pieces of silver, for Jesus is putting himself first to do financial gain. Each of those stories, and in many more, what we see is people making the decision that is best for themselves to the point that they ignore what they should do in regards to God. They put themselves first. And oftentimes, they choose self at the expense of others. David chose himself with Bathsheba at the of Uriah. Judas chooses himself at the expense of Jesus. We make decisions so often that hurt other people. We ignore their needs and we ignore God's desire for us in order to serve ourselves. And so Jesus is saying here in verse 25, you can do that. He also is saying you can ignore the cross in verse 25. Because the command here is to let somebody to, to deny themselves and pick up their cross. And he's saying, you have to choose to do that. Now, you can, you can, what you can choose to do is just ignore the cross and not pick it up and not suffer. And by the way, the reason why I put these in verse, out of verse order is because if you choose yourself, one thing you're not going to do is suffer by carrying a cross. You're never going to do that. You're going to let somebody else carry the cross for you. And the one who lives for self ignores the cross. It's understandable. It's interesting to put this in the context, by the way, here in verses 21 through 23 that we just read. Because what Peter says there is, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus says, your mind is in the wrong place. You're not thinking about the things of God. You're not thinking about spiritual things. You're thinking about yourself, the flesh. You ever wondered why people ignore the cross? It always goes back to the flesh. In fact, in Romans, there is this conflict that is presented throughout the book of flesh versus spirit. 
And those who don't choose spiritual things, those who don't think of heavenly things or the things of God, are people who are too focused on their flesh. Third, Jesus says, not only can you ignore the cross, but you can follow the world. There in verse 26, look at that. For what will the profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits its soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This mentality of gaining the whole world is the same mentality, really, of following the world. Because what is the world trying to do? Trying to gain the whole world. This will date me, but back at the end of my high school, college years, there was a cartoon, I think it's been rebooted now, which means when you're old enough that cartoons are rebooted, you're old. But it was called Animaniacs. You may remember that. And my favorite section of that was Pinky and the Brain. Right? And if you've ever seen that, you would have Pinky ask the Brain, what are we going to do this time of night? And the answer always was from the Brain, we are going to take over the world. And that's man's mentality. We want to take over the world. It's interesting in Matthew chapter 4, in verses 8 through 10, when Jesus is being tempted by Satan, the devil in verse 8 takes him to a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Now, we could get into the why that was a temptation for Jesus, and I believe it was a temptation for Jesus, otherwise it wouldn't be called that. But Jesus is tempted with this same offer that we think we have. You can have the world if you want to. Make that your pursuit. That's what success on earth looks like. Fourth, in verse 25, Jesus says you can save your own life for your own sake. You can save your life for your sake. And that's really what drives this idea of choosing myself, choosing the world, ignoring the cross, is that I can secure a full life. And I don't worry about salvation because this life is what's important. Let me read something to you about this this statement. It says, this person is attaining to what he considers a richer, happier life. The man described in verse 25 puts forth every effort to save or rescue his self, and having done so, to cling to it by every means. The focus here is me. I'm going to save and preserve myself. I'm going to take care of my own life. And she pointed out that Jesus clearly says this is a selfish option. He says you are doing this for your own sake. Doing this because of yourself. By the way, selfishness has never been And then finally, I want you to notice that there are rewards for this. Jesus says if you do this in verse 26, that you will gain the whole world. That's what Satan promised Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. And Jesus says here, if you choose this path, you will gain the whole world. Now that doesn't mean you'll be the ruler of the world and have an empire, but what it means is you'll have what you want. If you make wealth your goal, you will have wealth if you want it bad enough. If you make pleasure your focus, you will get pleasure. You will find it if that's what your focus is. If your family is your focus, then your family you will have, and you'll have a great family, but you will have a family that serves you rather than God. Whatever you make your world, you will have if you make it the goal of your focus. But he says also in verse 26, you will lose your soul. You will gain what you want, but you will lose your soul. It won't be there in the end. It will be lost. There's no eternity for you. In fact, I like the word Jesus uses here. Instead of lose, He says you forfeit your soul. When when I was playing sports, the one thing I hate is when we were in a position that we couldn't even play because somebody didn't show up. And you lost a game because somebody didn't show up. You couldn't even compete. You just forfeited. And that's what he's saying. Like You could choose this, but understand, you're willingly giving up your soul. You're forfeiting it. And thirdly, you will lose his reward and glory in verse 27. Jesus is going to come back, and he is going to repay people for their choices. 
And when that happens, you will have to be held accountable for the path of self-preservation. What that means is, you will not be glorified with the Son. The promise, when you choose the right path, we'll see in a moment, is that glorification with Jesus. Is that resurrection and eternal life, you give that up. You forfeit that as well. Now, what about the other path? The other path is the one of self-denial. In fact, we're not going to dive into this concept too deeply, but Michael Gorman wrote a book called Cruciformity that uses these three passages that say similar things of deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me to describe the disciple walk and saying that essentially that's what is at the core of serving Jesus. Self-denial, struggle or suffering through the cross, and following Jesus under all circumstances. I want to tell you before we dive into this path that one of the things you've got to understand is this is a much more difficult path. The path we looked at of self-preservation is a path that is easy, it is convenient, it is like water when it runs, it goes where it needs to go, it destroys what's in its process, and it gets to where it wants to go. You ever seen that? My, my house is built on a hill. When it rains hard, it creates its own path all the way down to the bottom. And in the bottom of the woods behind my house, there is not a creek unless it rains hard enough and then it creates its own creek. That's what the path of self-preservation is. You go where you want to go, you do what you want to do, and you destroy everything in your way, just like water. This is different. Jesus said that the first step of this is you deny yourself. You deny yourself. Those are the plain words. By the way, our culture tries to tell us that self-denial is abuse, and it is not. Self-denial is not abuse. It is not a lack of self-esteem or self-care. It is also not a false sense of humility, by the way. Neither is it a feeling of being less than than other people. If you think that's what self-denial is, you are misinformed. Self-denial means that you renounce the old life and the old man. You put aside who you used to be. You give up your old identity. You give up your old desires. You give up anything that gets in the way of you following Jesus. That could be friendships, that could be behaviors, that could be interests, that could be hobbies, that could be desires, that could even be family. If anyone loves father or mother more than me, right? At the end of the day, self-denial could be those things. It means you don't seek your own interest anymore. And you are now consumed with serving King Jesus. Paul provided good commentary of what this looks like in Galatians 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself. That's what it looks like. That's self-crucifixion. And that leads us to this idea, verse 24 as well, of taking up your cross. This is the second time, by the way, in the book of Matthew we've seen this statement. The first time is in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 38. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Very similar here. Sometimes I think we misunderstand this idea of taking up a cross. You ever heard people say, well, this is just my cross to bear? I got to tell you that most of the time people say that, it's not really the same idea of this step. You meet somebody who suffers from a genetic disorder or some disease or suffered because of their sins, well, that's just my cross to bear. Now, let me just say about that. I understand that there's struggle and suffering that go along with those things, but when Jesus says to take up your cross, He is not saying that you are carrying your personal burdens. Applying the suffering of self to the idea of carrying the cross lessens the cross's power and sacrifice for us. Taking up your cross means you identify with Jesus in the rejection, the suffering. If I'm suffering because of personal choices and sin, that is not the same thing as suffering because because I follow Jesus. Taking up your cross means that you are willing to endure the pain and suffering and shame and persecution. Jesus. Taking up your cross 
taking up your cross is, means that you are willing to give up your honor to take on the cross of the world. It's worth it. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what this idea is. And then he says, follow me. That's kind of the point, isn't it? Jesus is really saying to these disciples, you've got to choose to be disciples. You gotta choose to follow me. And the one who decides to sacrifice self and deny self and its selfish wants and its selfish desires, and in turn puts their trust in the leadership and guidance of Jesus, even to the point of picking up a cross, it is his cross as you follow him. Here's another quote. If anyone wishes to be counted as an adherent of mine, he must once and for all say farewell to self, decisively accept pain, shame, and persecution for my sake, and in my cause must then follow and keep on following. I want you to focus on that last statement. Keep on following. You know, I think when we first come to the understanding of who we are and that we need to be Redeemed, we need to be justified and washed by the blood of the Lamb, put in the end, baptized. There's a part of us that is energetic, excited to be a believer, a follower of Jesus. But then as time comes on and goes on, one of the things that happens sometimes is it just kind of becomes part of our routine, less of our identity. This idea of following Jesus should be a daily renewal. I have to wake up every morning and say, but today, I'm not going to just be Terry Francis who pursues the things of the world, but rather I'm going to deny that, take up the cross of Christ, and follow Him. It is a daily decision. That decision did not only happen when you got in the baptistry. It happens every day after. If that is not on our minds, we need to find a way to make sure that it is. We need to find a way to focus on that truth and make sure that we are making that choice every day. He then says in verse 25, you will lose your life for His sake. You will lose your life for His sake. How much are you willing to suffer for the cause of Christ? One of the interesting things I think that we don't realize is Sometimes what we spend a lot of our time doing is trying to make sure we can minimize our suffering as much as possible. I'll be honest with you, that's one of the motivating factors behind our political decisions as Christians. We are trying to elect people we think preserve our ability to exercise our faith with the least amount of suffering. We're told that we should be willing to go to the point of death. And I'm asked sometimes, well, what is going to happen if, if they take these uh, freedoms away from us? And I'm still going to believe. What do they threaten your life? They threaten my life. I'm amazed at some of our brethren in places like China who have to make it. I am thankful I'm not in a place where I have to do that daily. But I'm going to tell you that I am, hopefully, I, this is true, that by faith I am ready and willing to stand that way when it becomes necessary. Because one of the things I've learned in the study of discipleship and, and our faith is that it is easy to follow Jesus when we live in a place like America. I mean, we are not persecuted very much. And the things that we think are persecution pale in comparison to the real persecution. I've never been beaten because I confess Jesus. I have faced zero economic hardship because I follow my faith. I have not suffered the way that so many in the first century suffered and so many today still suffer. My sufferings pale in comparison. 
but I need to be ready and willing and able. You ever think about characters in the Bible who exemplify the idea of suffering and sacrifice and denial in order to follow after God and God's plan? I mean, the story of Jonathan is amazing to me that Jonathan supports God's anointed when Jonathan should have been the anointed. You ever thought about that? You ever compare Jonathan to his dad? You, you talk about the good son. Or how about the story of the good Samaritan? Or this Samaritan chooses, and, and I know it's a parable, but chooses everything exactly like what God would have him to do. In fact, if you do a deep dive on that, one of the beautiful things about the Good Samaritan is that that statement about loving your neighbor as yourself that is the crux of that discussion between Jesus and the one asking is that is it valid in Leviticus 19? And in the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus masterfully weaves the context of Leviticus 19 into there, showing the Samaritan going well beyond what the Torah commanded them to do. He gave of himself. Aphroditus, Paul, so many that were willing to risk and to give up anything and everything for the sake of Christ. Fifth, moving on, he says that you will forsake the world. If you choose this path, the world cannot be your focus. See, the first choice was that you chose the world and you follow the world and you gain the world. But this choice is you turn your back on the world. You forsake the world. In Colossians chapter 3, is a great text there where Paul really describes in detail this change of the person when they come to Christ. But notice in the first two verses, if you have been raised with Christ, think the, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. That last statement, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are of the earth. How often do first world problems dominate our thinking? How often is the only thing we can talk about as brethren things like sports? And, and I love that, but sometimes we need to get together and be able to talk about the things. Have you ever sat down and just talked about what you think heaven's going to be like? Why is it that I can talk to my neighbor about politics, I can talk to them about sports, I can talk to them about the weather, I can talk to them about the best restaurants in town, I can talk to them about the fact that the best donuts are located in Memphis, Tennessee. Gibson's Donuts, if you've never been there, it's fantastic. Blueberry cake is the best. I can talk to them about all of those things. But when it comes to Jesus, I can't talk about spiritual things. I'm too scared. Now, if that's me, how can I say that I have made the choice to forsake the world? Spiritual people live like spiritual Live like spirit. Now there are rewards here. Jesus says, here's the rewards. You get to keep your soul in verse 26. You get to keep your soul when you make this choice. One of the most interesting paradoxes ever spoken by Jesus is this one. If you save your life, you lose it. If you lose your life, you save it. What? That's really strange, isn't it? And yet the point is, when you don't put yourself first anymore, you get to keep your soul. You have eternity to look forward to. You have a future. What if we spend as much time making this choice as much as we do, as we do invest in it? Which one do we spend more time? Secondly, you get to share his reward. Matthew 16 and verse 27 says, For the Son of Man is going to come with the angels in the glory of His Father, and He will repay each person according to what He has done. There is a day of reckoning. Matthew 25 sets these three judgment scenes up. It has there those three different stories, and it ends with that one where He talks about what you've done to the least of these. First of those stories, right, is that uh, I think it's the first is the parable of the talents and that idea of, hey, look, the master's going to come back. He's given you these things. How have you done with what you've been given? By the way, those talents aren't things like leading singing. 
That's where we always go with that. Well, he's got the talent lead singing. That's not what we're talking about. And here's the thing. All of us, at the very least, are a one-talent person, meaning how have we done at things like talking to other people about Jesus? What have we done with the word that's been entrusted to us? All of us have been given and the investment of God's word, the most treasured possession we could be given, is this right here. What have we done with it? There is a day that you are going to have to face the judge, the master. He's going to say, what have you done with what I've given you? That's the idea here. Don't put your focus in your life winning the things of this world. You will always end with a loss. Make sure you let Jesus provide the rest. Now, I want real quick for you to see how this lines up with Jesus. See, you can live for yourself or you can deny yourself. Those are the choices. You can ignore the cross or take up your cross. You can follow the world or follow Christ. You can save your life for your own sake or you can lose your life for your own sake. You can gain the world or forsake the world. You can lose your soul, you can keep your soul. You can lose His reward and glory or share His reward and glory. Jesus is saying to His disciples, here's what's going to happen. Peter says, no, that's never going to happen. He then says, you've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice whether you're going to follow me. And what Jesus is saying here partially is, no, Peter, this is exactly what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen to me. Choose what you want to do. It's interesting to me that by the time we get to Acts 1, I'm not sure that we are limited to only 120 disciples, but we know that's how many are recorded. And the one thing that tells me is that the multitudes that followed Jesus at times, a great deal of them didn't make the right choice. So as we move to our conclusion, here's the question. Who will follow Jesus? While there are two choices here, only one of them involves you. Now, let me make sure you understand. You can think you've chosen Jesus and choose the wrong choice. Only one of them, though, truly involves following Jesus. And that is the choice of sacrifice and self-denial. I think sometimes we just view discipleship as a lesser commitment. As a less costly commitment. Think about the ministry of Jesus before His death. We see again these, these great multitudes following Him. And like I said, we've got these 120 disciples that are there. Now, there could be more, but we have 120 that are gathered together, that have made an effort, who are sitting there, who have put life on hold, for lack of a better description, to figure out what in the world is about to happen. They're confused, they don't know, but they are sitting there trying to figure that out. Why? Because we know for this, we know those 120 have at that point denied themselves and are trying to follow Jesus. Now, I believe that they don't truly understand that till the Spirit comes and says, this is what that looks like. At that point, that's how many are sitting there denying themselves. And it's interesting here, and we think about this, what we learn in Matthew chapter 16 is following Jesus is something that demands that idea of great sacrifice. I have got to completely empty myself. And by the way, 1 Peter 2 and verse 21, for this you've been called because Christ suffered for you Leave an example so that you may follow in his steps. I think sometimes we go, well, that just means I'm going to be like rejected sometimes. No, I want you to put this text into the context of what happens there in Jerusalem in that last week, and specifically that last day. Walk in his steps down the streets of Jerusalem with the cross. That's what the context is calling you.
It's not easy. And that's not a commitment we take lightly. Or should. One of my favorite authors is a guy named E.T. Wright. Listen to these words. The call goes out to follow Jesus. The call which rings down the centuries like a great bell in a distant church. Calling us from whatever we're doing. Imagine the bell echoing through the streets of your town. Pick up your cross. Follow me. Pick up your cross. Follow me. Imagine its sound resonating through shops and offices, schoolrooms, hospital wards, through bustling tenements and lonely apartments. Pick up your cross and follow me. Imagine people coming out of their doors to see where the noise is coming from, to listen to this great bell, and there walking ahead of them is Jesus, a compelling and mysterious figure. I want to make sure you understand something, though. If you want to choose to follow Jesus, that's not something you've accomplished past. This idea is not the idea of putting a bumper sticker on your car or wearing a shirt or showing up to church when the doors are open or telling your friends that you're a Christian or wearing a, a cross around your neck like this. It is not some kind of average mediocrity that confesses Jesus but lives like everybody else lives. Following Jesus is a denial of self. It is changing everything about you to the point that you are willing to give up your friendships, your family, and even your own life. If that's what it takes. That's what you are being called to. Somebody once compared this to learning to swim. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but when you learn to swim, you can keep your foot on the bottom of the pool in the shallow end, and you can be in the pool. You can be safe. You'll never, ever know how to swim. Now, you can move to deeper water, and you can keep your bottom on the ground of the pool, and you can drown. So some, at some point, have to make a decision. Are they going to swim, or are they going to drown? Because walking safely on the bottom of the deep is not possible. In your mind, you believe, by the way, if you pick up your foot, you will die because you can't swim. And yet, if you want to live, you've got to pick up your foot and learn to swim. And we jokingly have talked about people that just throw kids in the deep end and let them learn how to swim. By the way, that's probably abuse today. It was definitely practice when I was a child. I learned to swim. In a very real sense, and we may chuckle about that, but it's a very real illustration that says, if you want to lose your life, then put your life away. But if you want to live, you have to be willing to risk your life. That's what disciples and in that illustration, the bottom of the pool is our life, our world. We can do this all the time. We can do this. We're going to lead. It is only when you pick up your foot and you allow yourself to trust you. If you'll follow him, you'll then learn swim. In doing that, we'll save you. You will be given. Following
Thank you so much.